Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, September 30th. Your show moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Paula for doing the closed captioning for, or thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Paula is actually going to introduce Patty Harju for us, whose topic is breakout EDU game design. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula now. Good morning, Classroom 2.0 Live friends. I am so excited to introduce to you today Patty Harzu, who is the Director of Games for Breakout EDU. In this role, she has written games published on the Breakout EDU website, reviews and published games submitted by the Breakout EDU community, and facilitates workshops on game design. Prior to this adventure, she was a classroom teacher with over 20 years of experience teaching in the elementary grades. She holds a master's in education and a bachelor's degree with emphasis in math and reading. She is a past board member for the Michigan Association for Computer, Using, for Computer Users in Learning, McCall, and Discovery Education Star Educator. She has presented workshops on technology integration, classroom blogging, coding, gamification, and more at many state and local level events. In the summer, she also enjoys the many delicious adventures of co-owning Pinky's Ice Cream Shop in her hometown. I personally know Patty through our time spent together at a couple of DEN, Discovery Educator Network, summer institutes and we get to see each other most summers at ISKI. I have learned a lot about Breakout EDU from Patty since she created many of the games I have used with my students. It is my great pleasure to introduce Patty Harju, who in my book is the queen of Breakout EDU. And Patty, our newbie question is, I'm going to advance the slide. There we go. How do games like Breakout EDU help students to become better problem solvers and critical thinkers? All right. Uh, is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Did I push the right button? All right. Um, well, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank uh, Classroom 2.0 Live, Paula, Peggy, everyone for inviting me. This is a wonderful opportunity. I'm happy to be here. And to answer the newbie question, how do games like Breakout EDU help students become better problem solvers and critical thinkers? Well, we learn by doing, and when students are playing breakout EDU games, they are solving problems. They are thinking critically. This is the root of what a breakout EDU experience is. Um, the students, when they enter a room and they see the breakout box and the clues, the directions are not there. So they have to not only figure out how to solve the problem, they have to figure out what that problem is. And we'll talk more, but the four C's are an integral part of um, breakout EDU experience. So breakout EDU is problem solving and critical thinking at its very core. Okay. Well, welcome to breakout EDU. Um, good morning or good afternoon. And again, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here to share all that is awesome about breakout EDU, especially game design, which is my passion. It's what I love. Um, I am from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and if uh, we were in person, you would see me holding up my right hand, and I would be pointing to my palm, and it would be the uh, side opposite the thumb and the lower hand to show you where I'm from, as all Michiganders do. Okay, so what is Breakout EDU? Since we have some newbies here, I want to explain what this is. It's that idea of an escape room in the classroom. We can't lock students in a room. So with Breakout EDU, what we have is a box with locks, and instead of having the students try to break out of the room, they are trying to break into the box. And there are clues and puzzles, some are physical, some are digital, and the students, again, have to figure out how to put all that together to figure out the combinations to open the locks. Breakout EDU is immersive learning. And it's those four C's. The kids have to collaborate. They have to think critically. They have to communicate. And they have to be creative when solving breakout EDU puzzles. 
The power of breakout EDU is in that act of learning. Kids are up and out of their seats. They're moving around. Um, your breakout games may not be very quiet, and that's okay. Uh, the teacher really takes a step back when the students are playing. And I've had to learn, um, as I've been facilitating more and more games, to be quiet, which is usually hard for me, to step back and to not step in too soon. So the ownership of the learning is on the students, and they are figuring things out, and it's a very active environment. Again, those four Cs are um, in every breakout EDU game. And the other favorite piece is the cultivating grit. Our students are trying over and over. They may fail and that lock doesn't open and they usually look at the instructor and think that the combination is wrong and we let them know, no, the combination is not wrong. You just need to try again to figure that out. So the gives the students that opportunity to fail forward. And what's really fun is when they do open that lock, you are going to hear your students cheer. They're going to be excited that they got it right. And in all my experience teaching, I didn't have too many kids cheer when they got a math problem right. But with Breakout EDU, you're going to have the kids excited about that learning and about that problem solving. All right, and 10 reasons to play Breakout EDU. This is a great sketch note from Maria Galinas and Sylvia Duckworth. And in the chat, just share the ones that jump out at you. What are the things that are popping out at you from these 10 reasons? And what I love is that the 10 reasons these things are transferable to every subject, every topic. This is what we want our kids doing in school. Yep, we want them to be inquiry-based. It challenges players to persevere. It's building those inference skills. You know, I love that it's fun and the student-centered and problem-solving, the collaborative. And there are more. We could probably come up with 10, 20 more reasons to play breakout EDU. So Breakout EDU already has over 400 games on our Breakout EDU website. And these are games, many of them were created by the Breakout EDU team. And we also have quite a few that have been submitted by members of the community, which is what we'll be encouraging you to do with the games that you design and that you create. And then we will publish them. So if we have a website with over 400 games on them, then why would you design games? Well, designing your own games gives you that opportunity to be in control of the learning. Um, it helps you design games that closely match your standards, um, and it gives your students that opportunity to work on those standards in a more meaningful environment, in a meaningful way. And so I really love the design process. That's why I have a job with Breakout EDU, because I started designing my own games. But it helps you create the games. You also get an inside look at how your kids think, because you're trying to create a clue, and you're thinking about how your kids are going to solve that clue, what they're going to find um, when they solve it. So let's get into design. The first part of designing a game, now, of course, yes, you have your stories, or you have your, um, if you want to work on fractions, or if you are working on a, a certain topic in science, chemistry. But really, to start the game design process, you need a good story. And the story is what hooks the students. It gets them interested. If they walk into a room and you say, hey, kids, we have this box. And we're going to work on fractions. And if we do a great job with fractions, we're going to get the box open. They're not going to be all that excited about it. So you need some kind of a story to get them into the, into the mood of opening the box. You know, oh no, the weather wizard was in our room last night and he has changed it so that it's going to be snow and cold all the time. If we don't get into the box and open it and break the weather wizard spell, we're going to be stuck in winter. And so then that would be the story that gets the kids going to play the game. And that is the importance of the story is why do they want to open the box? We have to give them that reason to open the box. Here are a couple examples of some stories from games on the website. In Dr. Bohr, in the quest for hope, uh, Dr. Candace Bohr, they enter her office and she is missing and there are clues all about the room. And uh, in the end, what they have to do is get her research so that they can save the world. In the case of the Mondays, the um, Prince, this is a game by Kim Alvarado. 
And in the case of the Mondays, the principal clicked on one of those links in the email that you're not supposed to click on, and he caused it to be Monday every single day. And so if the students don't get into the box and open it, they won't be able to break the curse of the Mondays. And we all know as teachers we don't want every day to be Monday. Caught in the code, the story there is that the students stepped into the room and they got caught in an infinite loop. And now they're stuck and they're going to repeat the same hour of the same day over and over and over unless they can break the code and escape the loop. And that's a game that's coding based and it's uh, unplugged coding activities so that the students can um, work on coding within a breakout game and then they have to escape the loop. The faculty meeting is one of our favorite games, and this was Adam Bellow's story idea, that the uh, agenda, every staff meeting needs, a, needs an agenda, and the second half of the agenda is locked in the box. And the superintendent has locked it there because he wants faculty meetings to go on forever. And so the only way to escape the faculty meeting and break out, or it, the only way to escape the faculty meeting is to solve the problems, open the box, get the rest of the agenda, and then the meeting can be finished. So those are some story ideas for stories that are on the website. So as we talk about the story and why they're opening the box, we need to address what's in the box. And if I play this with my students for the first time, and I fill that box with candy and candy bars, and the kids, of course, break out, and then they have candy and they're all excited, what happens the second time? that I play breakout with my students. They want candy and candy bars. And if we put prizes in the box, then the students are playing the games for the prizes. And they're mixed, missing the idea that it's about the problem solving, it's about the teamwork, it's about those elements of the game. So we don't put anything in the box. The prize is the breaking out. You might have, um, I often print this um, quote right here, and that's in the box. Sometimes there might be a little badge that says we broke out kind of thing that the kids can wear. But the box is empty. The goal is to open the box and save the world. And that's actually usually enough for the kids. And we take the great end of um, game photo where they hold the signs and they're all excited about it. So again, make sure when you play the games you think about that, about what's in the box. All right, so we are here for game design today. So we're going to kind of talk about some different clues and some of the um, in game design and how those can work together. So the one thing you need to start with, you have your story that you're thinking of, but you need to also think about the kit and the, item, the uh, items that come in the kit because you want your clues to work with the items in the Breakout EDU kit. So every kit comes with the large Breakout EDU box in the middle. And then there is the blue half, and then there's a smaller box. And most games, the half is put on the large box, and when you fold that half together, um, those six holes line up, and then you are able to put those other four locks on that one box. So the students need to solve the puzzles to get all four of those locks off. And then the small box usually has the three-digit lock on it, and often there's something in that box that the students need in order to solve one of the other puzzles. Sometimes it's the flashlight or the, um, the USB drive is there. You can put a file on that to be a clue for a game. Um, and there's, again, there's the UV pen, so things are often written in invisible ink. And then over we have the, um, we have the cards that go with the, uh, those are the reflection deck cards. And those are, I often put those in the box, and so the kids will take those after they break out and that they can start that discussion of the debrief of what worked well in the game, what they need to improve on, that's a really important step we'll touch, touch on later. When you're designing your games, now that you have your kit and you have your story, it's also important that there are different levels of difficulty of the clues. If every clue is really hard and takes them 15 minutes, they're going to get a little bit frustrated. So you need some of those clues to be what we call kind of the on the nose and then a little more difficult. And then this particular game has all three of those levels. The clue at the bottom is uh, it's 
has directions and a map, and it's the direction lock clue, so that when a um, when a player finds that clue, they will notice it says go east, go west, go north, go south. And so that's an easy clue, and the kids feel confident. They've had success early in the game, and then it keeps them going. And then the second clue has two parts. It has that QR code, and it has um, it actually has some strings that go with it, and the students need to put those two pieces together. Again, it's a little more complicated than the first clue, but usually they can get it pretty easily. And then the last clue in this game has several levels. Um, has three or four different clues that they have to find that work together, a lot more creative thinking and collaboration. They will eventually get it. But again, you can see that we have the different levels of complexity and the different levels um, for the clues. And this is just another example when you're creating a game, you want to think about the game flow. We, most of the games on the site are not linear, meaning that you don't need to solve this clue to go to this clue. There isn't a specific order for solving the clues. So in a game like Time Warp, you can see by the lines, the first clue, the hieroglyphics, goes to that lock, gets it right off the box. So that can be solved separate from the other. Same thing with the uh, second direction clue. You'll see as you go down the third clue, it needs that UV flashlight that was actually locked in the three-digit box. So that's the situation where they need to get the three-digit box open to get the flashlight to figure out that clue. And then again, there's that other clue that's a little more complicated down there. Whoops. What did I do? OK, so shall we play a game? All right, I am going to, I'm going to give you it's not enough something up on my I'm going to give you a um, uh, give you a clue on the next slide and I'm going to give you about two minutes now if you're playing a game with your students in the classroom they would be talking to each other and helping each other out um, you can talk within the, the chat and I encourage you to share your ideas um, with each other as you get this clue I'm going to give you about two minutes so let's see if you can't figure that out all right, there is your clue. Um, one thing, usually with the students, I wouldn't necessarily give them the um, I wouldn't give them the lock that they're using. Um, so they would have to figure out which lock it is. In this case, since we have less time, you guys will have the um, have the ability to know which lock it is. Okay, so I'm going to actually be quiet, and you have about two minutes. Give you a couple more minutes. The timer doesn't work on here, but I was going to play the timer and the fun timer music. If you if you gave us an answer, how did you get that answer? I see somebody put 143 in there. How did they get? Why do they think it's 143? Why do you think it's 143? Any of you want to share? Very good. All right, we'll go on. Um, this is an example. This you didn't need the letters on this one. Each of these elements of the Minecraft table of elements. This is from the game Back to Reality, Minecraft theme. And if you match each of the elements, they each have a number. You'll notice some of you found the letters, but they don't really spell anything, and um, you have a three-digit lock. So if you take 73, 8. 52 and 10 and add them together, you get 143 combinations of the three digit lock. This was a game um, I meant to tell you that was really about third, fourth, fifth grade ish. I have played it on all the way up with adults. Um, so, and it is a fun one. Here's another clue from the same game. If you just saw this on the wall, what would you think the combination is? 
you would probably think it's up, right, up, left, down, but you would be missing part of the clue. The clue in invisible ink on each of the pickaxes, also from the Minecraft game, is written in invisible ink. Um, and I've noticed kids first think that it's a V and an I and they're spelling a word. And then they figure out that it is Roman numerals. So this is a great way to get your students working with Roman numerals. And we just, I just used one, two, three, four, five here. But you could certainly, um, if you wanted the kids to work on harder or higher Roman numerals, it wouldn't have to be consecutive. Um, another option might be if you're working with fractions to write fractions on this clue. This is the kind of clue that's adaptable to many different subjects. Um, fractions would have to be in order, or you could put um, algebraic expressions or other mathematical expressions on there. Um, you know, share some ideas in the chat of how, what, how you might use this clue as well. Um, another idea I thought of is uh, in the younger grades, alphabetical order was something we worked on, and maybe to the second or third letter. So I could have written five words on here, and then the students, again, the directions aren't there, but the students need to figure out that they um, would need to put them in the order of alphabetizing the, the words to put them in the right order. All right, let's go through some of the yep, order of operations. Good ideas in there. Um, let's go through some of the puzzle types. So this is an example of what we call the on the nose puzzle. So this is that letter from the uh, earlier in the presentation. Head north, come south, go east, go east, come back west. And the students would just do that directly on the direction lock. The other two um, letters here are from Dr. Bohr's game, and they were found on her desk. And as the students read those two letters, they would notice that the number 780 million is listed a couple times in them. And so they would come up with 780 as the combination to the three-digit lock. A couple other easier um, type clues using this one uses the, um, the, the paper clips. Um, and it has three different colors. And uh, you would put the order green, pink, yellow, or you could leave that out because with three digits, there's only six different combinations. And so that's a skill I think we or that we did work on in second grade. So you could just give them the paper clips and they would have to figure out the possible um, order. The boarding passes, these each have 4A, 7B, and 3C on them. So the students would find those. And again, they would have the order for the three digit lock. Now, the next step in the puzzle is that two in one idea, where you're putting two different things together to create a clue. So here is the um, hieroglyphics clue from Time Warp. And the neat thing about this clue is all that the students will get is the hieroglyphics. They will have to go online and do a little research to find the correct alphabet, and there's more than one alphabet. And so when they match it, they'll first come up with four letters. Um, and then they will have to figure out that they need to convert those to numbers for the four-digit lock. And I did run this. This game is usually run with adults and high school kids. I ran it with a group of fifth graders. And there's one piece of math later in this game that they needed help with. But every other clue they got really quickly. It was interesting to watch. Here's another idea. This is a three-digit clue where they use two parts. There's a QR code, um, and then there were these sets of strings. And the QR code helped them with the order in which strings they needed. The QR code told them red, green, blue, I believe. And so then they knew they needed the red, the green, and the blue strings to come up with the combination. All right, this is from Adam's game, Attack of the Locks. And I'm going to give you part of it, and then see if you can figure out what the combination is. So this is the, this is uh, the Star Wars alphabet. And when the students convert this part right at the top here, this says use the force. And this last word is force. And so who thinks they can figure out what the direction lock clue combination is? Yeah, I don't see any guesses. 
So if you're using the force, I love this clue. There's the F at the top, the O, the R, the C, and the E. And so you have to go around the circle with those letters to get the combination. Here's another example of a code. Um, and again, the code would be somewhere else in the room, and the students would have to find that it's the, just the A, Z, B, Y letter substitution. And so this one says, oh, a place that you should look is near a book. And they, again, won't know that it's the key they're looking for, but they would look um, over by um, a book. We assumed all classrooms had books, so that would be a good place to hide a clue, and they would look there for the key. Here is a clue from our dot game. Now, the students would have to match the Morse code symbols, and I'm going to let you see if you guys can um, solve this one as well. I will give you this hint. I'm going to put them in order. So they would be putting the clues in order of the life cycle of the butterfly, and then they would be trying to figure out what um, the word is. Anybody? And let's see if you guys can figure this out. Yay, very good. We got it. Yep, it is brave. Very good. Yeah, and the kids do. I see that in there. Someone said once the kids get the idea. The kids do get the idea after a while. But every clue in every game is different, so it's still a new challenge every single time that they're playing. I love this clue. This is uh, um, inspired by a clue from the game The Missing Assignment by Kim Alvarado. And the students would find the coordinates in the, maybe in the three-digit box. And then they would have to find each of those points on the map. So 20 degrees south, 60 west, I think takes you right there to the number eight. And so they would get the four digits in order. There are ways to take this clue and make it more difficult as well. So instead of 20 degrees south, 60 degrees west, I could have 20 as a mathematical expression. I could have 60 as a mathematical expression. Uh, if I was working on number words, I could write the word 20, write the word 60, write this all out in words. Um, you know, even if you're working on numbers in another language, maybe write 20 in Spanish and 60 in Spanish. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you could use this clue. And so when you're working on those standards and skills and giving the kids a puzzle to solve. And this is also from that same or inspire. This is from the missing assignment. And this is a three-part clue. And the students first find the mathematician safe company. Um, and this is on the three-digit box. And they see 570. So of course they try 570. Doesn't work. Then they find this puzzle of these gorgeous mathematicians up in the room. And Pythagoras is fought, born in 570 BC. So then they would go to the mathematical formulas and see that beautiful Pythagorean theorem. And it has a question mark at C. So then they will eventually figure out we're looking for that 3, 4, 5 right triangle. And the combination is 3, 4, 5. And another puzzle type is puzzles that determine a pattern. So there might be something missing. And again, you want your kids looking for those patterns and what's missing. So what do you think the combination is to this one? Each poster represents one number in the three-digit combination. If you look at this one, it has 235. We just said this was pattern. So what number is missing? I'm assuming you all just said four. I can hear you. So we've got four, yep, and then one, two, three, four. So three is missing there, and four, five, and then seven. So six is missing. So yep, four, three, six would be the combination. Um, this is for the younger grades and place value, four digits. I probably wouldn't have the white um, rectangle with the question mark for the clue for the kids. They would just get these five cards. Yep, and they would have to figure out that 3,477 is the number that's missing. So they'll start by trying all of these numbers as the combination and then get into that idea of looking to see what's missing. Here is a, a 
one that's more high, that's high school, higher level math. This is the game Every Drop Matters. And players learn the water levels for all the years except 2012. So this um, red number is not um, included, and that's the one they figure out. So they see this chart over here, and then they have the information over here. And they'll need to figure out the relationship between the numbers and that there's a 20% um, drop of water. This one happens to, this red number is actually a, um, goes on a website code to lead them through the game. It's not a, a lock. And then there's the idea of a bigger puzzle, a bigger reveal. And the best example I think of that is from the time warp game, again, that we mentioned earlier, that has quite a complicated puzzle. So students get the letter and then this Morse code, and they'll also find this um, art image in the room. And then from those clues, they need to visit um, a website, which takes them, gives them access to this video and this information. And then they have to put all that together to get that four-digit combination. So there's a lot of pieces that have to go together to get the combination. So shall we play another game? All right, the next one I'm going to give you is a little bit harder. I'm going to give you maybe two and a half minutes. And this is from Dr. Bohr, and you entered, and I'm going to actually to give you a hint before you start. I'll show it to you. And Dr. Bohr, this Powerball ticket was crumpled up and just on the floor. And um, it is the four-digit lock combo. The red arrow is just pointing to this list of numbers you need to pay attention to. And the UV flashlight illuminated these uh, symbols by these numbers and uh, this down here that says remember 1986. So what would you do to solve this puzzle? Any ideas? All right, I'm going to give you the next clue. Um, if you took those numbers and you Googled them, you would be taken to the Ukraine. Those are latitude and longitude symbols. And if you just Google that, you go to the Ukraine. And then if you look to see what happened in 1986 in the Ukraine, anybody know of the event that happened? Yep, Chernobyl. And so if you look up, we know it's the year 1986, and that's not the combination, what it's actually looking for is the month and the day. And so they'll find that it was April 26th, and then 0426 is the combination. And that's, again, a higher level, pushing the player's thinking. And that's another situation where you need the group and the collaboration and the sharing of ideas. What I like with the sharing of ideas is that even when somebody has the wrong idea, that sometimes is enough to give someone else the right idea. So there are no bad ideas, but having kids share and appreciate, and boy, that's a great idea, but what about this? So just sharing those ideas gets some thinking and helps them solve the problem. So you want to design your own game. And so where do you begin? We On breakoutedu.com, if you click on learn more and then getting started, you're going to see the link to all our game design resources. And we provide you an official Breakout EDU game template. If you're going to submit your game to be published on the website, and we certainly encourage you to do that, this is the um, template that you should um, complete. When you're designing the game, the things you need to think about are how you can, um, how that game can be replicated in another teacher's classroom. Whenever I create a game, I'm trying to be as specific as I can and give all the details and anticipate the questions someone else might have. So first, when you fill out the template, of course, your name. Um, give, your, give your game a fun name, not math review eighth grade. You know, give it a fun name and get that story in there. Why do the kids want to open the box? What content areas are you working on? Fractions, um, decimals, percentages, chemistry, um, grammar. Uh, and then what group size? You can run a whole game with, or a game with one kit in the whole class. 
having the kids keep track of combinations and recording them and taking turns on the box. And I did this with um, quite a few groups. I prefer to have more boxes now. But there are different group sizes. So specify if you think your group, your game really works better for a small group or if it could be um, used with the whole class. Most games usually take 45 minutes. When I worked with my second graders, in any game I created that used all five locks, we usually needed that much time um, for everyone to get done. Now, if I'm playing an easier game, like a game designed for second or third grade with fifth grade or eighth grade or high school, then they're going to do it a little bit quicker. Make sure you include, again, the story, um, include the lock combinations, um, taking note the direction lock should only have five directions. The ABC lock should be a four or five letter word. And then outline the steps. It's very important to put more than print the resources, put the box here, get started. You need to, you need to also share how the clues are figured out. And that's what this brainstorm worksheet can help you do. If you think about what the combination is going to be, and then how are the kids going to figure it out? Get inside their heads, figure out how is this clue worked out? And then where will it lead? Are they opening a lock on the box? Or is it going to lead them to something they need um, to find that lock in the box? OK. And then if you check breakoutedu.com, the website, um, you will see this is more in our design again. You have that brainstorm sheet is right there. Images for the breakout edu kit, um, the ABC multi-lock, the letters that are on the lock, and then video templates. It's important when you design a game that you also have create a video that explains the game. Um, this is the setup video for the dot. We can't really show it here, but if you visit the breakout edu website and click on the dot, um, then you can watch the setup video and just see how each clue is explained. It shows um, how you're going to set it up, and it shows the combination and how the kids are going to solve it. And it's important, again, to have that written and then that video piece um, for every game. We also need to talk about copyright. While I love Harry Potter and I've read every book, I can't create a game that's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I can't use the images from J.K. Rowling's book. So we have to be aware of copyright. Now, we do have a book, The Dot, on the website, but we also um, have permission from the author, Peter Reynolds. He designed um, the bookmark, the game image, and the letter that went inside the box. So you need to be careful when you're creating games, especially if you're sharing them on the website, that you're using images that are copyright friendly. I know many teachers have been visiting Pixabay that has free images. Um, and then also Google if you make sure that they're um, copyright free if they're ones that you can use. Um, so be aware of copyright. If you do, if you're inspired by a clue from someone else's game, you know, make sure you get permission. Um, do not copy someone's game and then submit it to be published. You know, make sure it's your original work and they're your original images. So to recap the steps in creating a game, and this is, again, on the Breakout EDU website, you need that story. You need that hook. Why do kids want to open the box? Give them a reason. And then we want those clear instructions. We do want the directions for the teacher, step by step, how do you set it up? And then it's important to only use the core items from the Breakout EDU kit. Uh, because if you create this fabulous game but you're using these odd pieces, it's going to be harder for another teacher to replicate and, and do this game in their classroom. So we have tried to keep the games on the website so that they only use the core breakout EDU items. There are, there are a few, um, there are a few games that might have an extra lock, but we have the locks app or usually we have an option or you can leave it out. Um, and the printables. Uh, it's important to kind of lim limit the number of printables. What I also do when I'm creating a game is try and not have it be a consumable. I created a game once and I had this great idea and the kids were going to draw the arrows. And then when I printed it for four or five groups with each class in five classes, it was a mess. And I took a step back and reconsidered re, uh, that uh, clue. 
You want to think about the printables. And in fact, if it's something like with the Minecraft clue that I can print that, the little pieces, and I can print the uh, table, periodic table of elements, laminate them, put them up, I can use them over and over for other games. And laminating, um, I do that as much as possible. That saves um, that saves my clues from being written on when I have different groups play them. Um, the tip with the invisible ink is you can write with invisible ink and laminate over it. So the pickaxes that I do use for that Minecraft game, I wrote in invisible ink and I laminated. And now um, those are all set to go for the next game. Um, again, put all, all the resources in one single drive folder. Include the reflection questions. This is kind of the icing on the cake at the end of the breakout where you talk with the kids about how, um, about what worked in the game, what didn't work in the game, um, you know, how they can, how they can do better the next time. It's an opportunity for them to give a shout out to their teammates to recognize good problem solving. So, Always find time to use the reflection cards, and we ask you when you create a game to add two or three of those questions um, to your game. And we do have a game um, reward program, Game Design Rewards, and the first game that you submit and is accepted, um, there's a mystery swag bag. The second game is an expansion pack, which is um, our multi-locks with the color and shape wheels, and the third game gets you a free kit. And Another reason I started creating games is I saw that and I thought, I want to free kit. And so I created my games and submitted them. Um, down here at the bottom, I need to point this out. Not all topics are suitable for a breakout EDU game. So you need to also think about this when you're creating a game um, to share. You know, the Holocaust is not a game of, a game that, topic that we feel should be gamified. So just think about that when you're creating a game and um, whether it should be gamified or not. All right, I think I've just touched on the basics of game design with Breakout EDU. Um, we have resources available on the website, so please visit breakoutedu.com um, to get started. If you have any questions, I'm Patty with an I at breakoutedu.com or just email info at breakoutedu.com, and we'll be happy to answer any of their questions. So and I think now I open it to your questions. Is that right? Okay, Patty. Let's go one more slide and oh, go back to the questions. Um, let's see. Do you mix up the clues so they move between easy and hard, or do they build gradually up to hard questions, hard clues? Um, do you mix up? You know what? The clues have, are, I'll say that again. Do you have easy clues first and then harder cl clues later, or do you mix them up? You mix them up. When, you, when I set the game up, I have the clues kind of spread around the room. And mm -hmm. it's up to the students to kind of, or the players, to walk around and figure out the clues. Um, I might, if I want it to be easier, have the three-digit clue next to the three-digit box as kind of a hint. Because mm -hmm. they usually need to get into that first because there's something they need for another clue. But um, as a rule, you just kind of spread it around the room and let them figure it out. Okay. Are any of the games completely online? The, the value and the magic with Breakout EDU is the physical locks. Um, mm -hmm. Having the students work the problem and walk and open that lock, um, that's to me, that's the magic with it. Yeah, there are, there are some of the digital games, but mm -hmm. um, I just love the physical box, the locks, and the kids get excited about it. And also when they're playing the game with the physical box, you see a lot more of that collaboration, the communication, the creativity, the critical thinking, because they're physically moving around the room. They're not stuck in one place. They tend to be more isolated when they're doing things just on a computer. Okay. How important is a timer? 
for playing the games. When you had us play, you mentioned a time limit for solving that particular clue. How important is that timer? The timer is important because it, it gives the kids that beginning and ending. It also adds a little bit of a sense of urgency. It makes it more fun. Um, there is an end to how much time you want the kids working on this game. If they don't get it and they don't break out in 45 minutes, then you need to step back and review, and that's when you talk in the debrief. Sometimes they don't break out, and that's okay, too. Mm -hmm. I, I use the timer every time I do it with students. It's exciting for them. I had one class, and, and each group would finish at a different time, but the last group finished with two seconds left on the timer, and very exciting, very fun, but I think the timer is very important. On the Chino Chernobyl game example, where were the longitude and latitude numbers? The, the, so the six, it was six numbers that were on the Powerball ticket mm -hmm. had in purple um, the, the degrees, I think whatever the marks are that mark them for latitude and longitude, they were the six numbers. When I played the game, I actually usually circle those six numbers and then have the remember 1986. They wouldn't necessarily need to know their latitude and longitude. If they Googled all six of those numbers, it would take them to the Ukraine. And then mm -hmm. if they tied that in with 1986, they would have gotten it. Okay. Okay. What number of participants do you recommend? How do you deal with those students not engaged when it is the whole class participating? Usually when a whole class um, is participating, they might be working in smaller groups, and that depends on the age. Mm -hmm. Middle school and high school, they can be working in a bigger group of maybe 6 to 10 because they're going to divide and conquer. They might have two or three people on one clue, two or three on another. The mm -hmm. younger kids, you often set it up so they're kind of moving from clue to clue similar to a center idea. And they might be keeping track of the clues on a piece of paper. Um, you are going to find students that sometimes are not engaged. I had um, my little buddy in second grade. If he was sitting at his desk with a paper and a pencil, um, he would be engaged about 7% of the time. And he drew some beautiful squirrely, curly cues in the bottom of most of those papers. And if you mm -hmm. sat next to him, you got him engaged a little more. But when we played breakout, the first few times I had him, but I still only had him about 50%. I figured that was an improvement from 7%. And then sure. when uh, then when I played the Minecraft breakout game with him, I had him for the whole the whole time. But as we got through the year, he became more and more engaged. And the neat thing about him was he um, was not a paper and pencil kid, but I could see the thinking going on when he was playing the games and the puzzles. And that the breakout games help those kids shine a little more because mm -hmm. they aren't the traditional learners. The other thing I found was my um, very bright students who did get everything right. Her papers were perfect, being at the top, handed in where it should go, reading a book when she's done. When she looked at a breakout puzzle, she looked for about half a second, looked at me and said, I don't get it. And I would just say, everything you need is right there. She struggled because she was looking for those directions. Well, just yeah. tell me what to do so I can do it and I can sit down and read my book. So mm -hmm. it took her a little bit to get into it. But um, the breakouts really are a really valuable way to get to know your students, to encourage those students who aren't the ones that are always shining. They have the opportunity to shine. And to help our bright kids who are used to just following directions to get practice with that problem solving, that critical thinking, um, and use those other, use their four C's. How do students interact? Do they have their own accounts, or is it, the, or is the game printed, projected on a board for the whole class? The students do not have accounts. Um, the teacher mm -hmm. prepares it. It's it can be completely um, physical with no digital at all, unless one of mm -hmm. the clue involves a digital piece. So for the Minecraft game, I would have printed the pickaxes and the periodic table and the other clues, and there are a couple more that go with it. And I would mm -hmm. spread them around the room in the box with the locks. 
is in the middle of the room. I might assign the kids groups, but they and then they just go to work. And you set the mm -hmm. timer. You can project the timer on the uh, screen, but um, mm -hmm. there are no accounts. There's no access needed for students. It's the teacher prepares it all ahead of time um, for the students. Uh, then do you pull out the signs from somewhere after all are opened? Yep, the signs are um, on the website and you can print them out. And mm -hmm. they say we broke out, we rock. Um, and that's a great time. And there's also the signs for when they don't break out. But that's a great time to celebrate that learning. The kids love to take the picture. The, the last class I had was also really good at the fail picture. So when mm -hmm. they didn't break out, they were great at the sad expression. Mm -hmm. so that's another fun part is taking the pictures. And yep, that's all on the website. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for presenting today, Patty. Uh, Paula has her hand up. She'd like to, to get on the mic and, and tell us a few things about her experiences. Go ahead, Paula. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, the the um, breakout EDU games are just uh, phenomenal. You do get to see a completely different side of the students. Um, I find that my less studious students in the traditional classroom setting are usually the more successful breakout EDU students. Um, their thinking is not as rigid, um, and they just, you know, they're willing to try more things. I um, did the dot day one, that was our first one this year, and it was fantastic. My um, morning group broke out with eight minutes left, and my afternoon broke, broke out with 13 minutes left, and I didn't have to even use any hint cards. They went through it, and they just had a blast. Um, our assistant principal actually joined us uh, in the afternoon, and she is extremely competitive, and she, she was funny because she was not in the winning group, but when we did the debrief, um, one of my questions was, you know, what could you have done better? And she realized that as a group that they were not listening to each other's suggestions as well as they could have been. Um, when I have facilitated adult learners, um, one of the things that I notice is that some of the quieter people will kind of stand behind the group and say something, and they're overlooked. They're not listened to. So when I was given a hint card one time, I said to them, I said, my hint to you is you need to listen to all the members of your group because the little girl that was standing behind, the little teacher that was standing behind and being very quiet was spot on with all of, of her ideas, but nobody was listening to her. So it, it's such a phenomenal um experience to go through with your students and I love it and I am so grateful that I learned about it through Discovery Education and you, Patty and Adam and everybody else involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paula. Would anyone else like to take the mic and share your uh, experiences? Cindy, would you like, you've got the mic now, Cindy. Press that talk button. There you go. Um, I did, I have not experienced a uh, breakout EDU yet. This will be my first time. But my question is, if I have multiple groups but only one box, can I have multiple groups compete at the same time? Yes, you can. And that's how I started. I had one kit, and I did it with the whole class. And what I did is I had the, the box with the locks, you know, up in a central location. The three-digit box with that lock, or the, three, the small box with the three-digit lock was usually somewhere, and the clues were spread about, and so they would visit them center-like. Or I would have multiple copies of the clues so they could work on them at the same time. And then the students would keep track of the four combinations for the large box. And the key, I either had extra keys hidden or they would find something that said turn into the teacher for the key if they solved that clue. And then when they had all of the four combinations for the final, they would come up to the box, they would open all four as a group, they would cheer, we would break out, they would take, there was usually a we broke out sign for them in the box, they would take it out, and then we relocked it for the next group. 
And I did this multiple times, and I didn't find a bottleneck. There was one time where two groups were, you know, just seconds apart, but the one that got there first opened it, broke out, locked it up, and then the next group. So you absolutely can do it with one group. You know, when funding allows, you can get an additional group, but you can certainly do this with one with one kit. Thanks, Patty. Anyone else like to get on the mic? I will just add to what um, Paula said about the, the students that aren't your traditional uh -huh ones who um, shine. You know, I watched a group and I noticed my first forms were having a little trouble um, not both leading. And then they had another child who was sitting there, again, giving suggestions and they were completely ignoring her and she was right. And so I, and uh, I didn't wait for the ink card, but I did walk by and just said, you guys need to listen to your teammate, you know, to let them know to listen and talk. But it's, it's really interesting to see the group dynamics and to watch those kids shine that don't usually shine in the traditional um, environment. Wonderful. Again, thanks so much, Patty. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. I hope you're all ex as excited as I am. That was fabulous, and we know exactly what to do now. We just have to do it. So get on that site, register, check out some of the games, and start creating your own. Thank you so much, Patty. We have some great shows coming up every Saturday, and we hope you'll come back and join us. Next week, we have two featured teachers joining us to share about some of their great coding experiences, Michael Foster and Don Donahue. October 14th, we're going to be celebrating Picture Book Month with co-founders Katie Davis and Carol Lazar in honor of the founder, Diane de las Casas, who presented for us several months ago. October 21st, we have the amazing Rushton Hurley joining us to share tons of tips about becoming a better teacher. On October 28th, Sarah Thomas, creator of EduMatch, is going to be here to share all about EduMatch. November 4th, can't wait for Kara Martin to come and tell us about how she uses Snapchat for book snaps, gratitude snaps, and much more. And November 11th, we're going to be hearing from the amazing librarian, Tiffany Whitehead, who's going to teach us all about fake news and how to help our students learn more about that. So come back every Saturday. We would love to have you. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargett on Slatest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it, it is a free session. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site. Or you could take the, uh, you can find the form inside the live binder or in the chat, you'll find the link. Uh, you can also nominate yourself for a featured teacher for the month. The video collections on iTunes U. When you close the session, the survey should open up. You can take the link from chat. You can take this link, or you can take the link from the live binder. At the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And thanks to Patty Rossing, uh, you'll get this along with the, your name on the certificate. Uh, when you request this, please use a personal email address rather than the school email address because schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Patty Harju, Dispargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution. 
to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.